John chapter 7, and I'm going to start at verse 14 and read through 24. Please listen carefully, for this is God's word. Now about the middle of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and taught. And the Jews marveled, saying, How does this man know letters, having never studied? Jesus answered them and said, My doctrine is not mine, but he who sent me. If anyone wills to do his will, he shall know concerning the doctrine, whether it is from God or whether I speak on my own authority. He who speaks from himself seeks his own glory, but he who seeks the glory of the one who sent him is true, and no unrighteousness is in him. Did not Moses give you the law? Yet none of you keeps the law. Why do you seek to kill me? The people answered and said, You have a demon. Who is seeking to kill you? Jesus answered and said to them, I did one work, and you all marvel. Moses, therefore, gave you circumcision, not that it was from Moses, but from the fathers. And you circumcise a man on the Sabbath. If a man receives circumcision on the Sabbath, so that the law of Moses should not be broken, are you angry with me because I made a man completely well on the Sabbath? Do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. So ends the reading of the word. So the narrative now is moving from a private encounter between Jesus and his brothers. Remember last week? And now they're outside of Judea. When he met his brothers, they're outside of Judea. But now he's, he's going to have a public encounter with unbelievers in Judea. So this encounter takes place in the center of Jerusalem at the temple, and that's important to realize. Because the temple served as the center of Judaism. And now, it's, remember it says it's the middle of the Feast of the Tabernacles. So it's at this place, and at the time of worship, that provides this, I'll say, divine opportunity for Jesus. Despite the growing hostility that's being expressed towards him. You know, remember last week we finished up with warning of not st uh, staying quiet about our faith. You know, many times we're going to be called to proclaim our faith publicly. And uh, Sylvia kind of mentioned that in Bible study. What have I done to help God's kingdom? How about a public debate? That brings people in to the church that would not be in a church. You understand? You know, we you do more than you think. Let me put it that way. But at the same time, we're a remnant. But we God's going to give you opportunities to share your faith publicly. Are you going to take that opportunity or just say, I don't want to cause division. I don't want to cause somebody to wait. I, I, maybe I don't know how to answer the person. I, maybe if I share the gospel with somebody in the store, I'm not going to know what to say at that time. No, the Holy Spirit will give you the words to speak. Whoever confesses me before men, him I will confess before my Father who is in heaven. Now, John, in verse 14, it says, Now about the middle of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and taught. Now, there's an irony here in this verse. Because, remember last week, the Jews are busy erecting booths in order to participate in the ceremonies of the Feast of Tabernacles, ceremonies of their God. But the Lord God, Jesus Christ, arrives, and what does he do? He tabernacles among them. You know, that's the word that's used in John 1, 14. Way back when we were in John 1, you know, verse 14, when it says, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. But that word dwelt is tabernacled among us. That's what the word is. And so the word of God came and tabernacled among us. You notice this. Now he's in, in front of the temple. He's in the temple uh, uh, with a hostile crowd at him. And he's going to proclaim scripture to them. So remember... When, when Jesus, when his brother said, why aren't you going up to that feast? Are you scared? Jesus is not scared of anybody. He just knows when it's time to present, to teach. 
You know, it's like he's 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 delaying his arrival, and, and the crowd has this divided opinion on him. And, and it's, you think about it, there's probably massive anticipation uh, uh, for his appearance and his teaching. We need to hear from this Jesus. The atmosphere had to be tense and excitable. Jesus knows the perfect time when to not only speak to our hearts, but if he has to, to go against agnostics or atheists or people that are distorting the word of God. You know, when you distort the word of God, you're actually leading people to hell. Have you ever thought about that? We need not keep quiet when that happens. So the crowd's initial amazement for Jesus is, is that now that they're, they're amazed at him, but now they're going to grow restless after he speaks, and now they're going to start having a division about his identity. Who is this Christ really saying he is? In verse 15 it says, And the Jews marveled, saying, How does this man know letters, having never studied? You don't see this in the Greek, but it's a, it's a very important principle. The Jewish leaders are bringing what they call a forensic charge against Jesus. It's written like a legal charge against Jesus. And it started back in chapter 5. You know, many times as you go through the New Testament, it's legal terminology is being used. That's why Paul, it, it, I always thought, man, why he's always going in front of uh, uh law courts. You know, how many times do you have to go in front of the judicial for three or four times in the book of Acts? The book of Acts is like uh, being a witness to the authorities. It's a for a purpose. And, and we'll flesh this out more. But they begin to, they question him as the status as a teacher. And therefore they don't think, you know, that, that he has the authority to teach. Now, most Jewish males at that time were able to read and write. And they had a basic understanding of scriptures. So this is puzzling them. They, they can't make heads or tails of this because Jesus was able to carry on a sustained discourse of the scriptures. Remember when he was in the temple and the, they left on the caravan? And then it's like three days they realized Jesus is not with us. And so they went back marrying Joseph, looking for Jesus. And where did they find him? He was only 13 or 14 at this time. They found him in the temple. Uh, debating the Jewish authorities and they were completely amazed at his knowledge and so it's the same thing kind of happening here the traditional channels have not authorized Jesus to preach this is in their mind so they want to know what's your source or, or what's your insight and authority to, do, to be teaching this because it's actually going against what we've been teaching and here's the other thing that completely amazed them. And, you know, think about this. The rabbis of Jesus' day would teach by frequent appeal. They would appeal to other authorities. Nothing wrong with that. You'd be arrogant if you didn't, you know. We have uh, 2,000 years of church history to, to fall upon on. And, and the first people that did commentaries, Justin Motter and people like that, took what the apostles were saying. And just, it's not on the same authority as Scripture, but at the same time, it's good, helpful commentaries to learn the Word of God. It's, I'm not going to come up after 2,100 years, however long it's been, and come up with something brand new that nobody in the church has figured out in 2,000 years. That would be arrogant. So when I teach, I told you, you know, a couple weeks ago, I go by six commentaries. I read everything. I read what the other people, what they believe. And so, you know, it, it's, I'm not afraid of that, but Jesus, when he teaches, what is he? This is what makes him mad. He says, he'll say something like, you have heard it said, but I tell you. I tell you. Or he says, I tell you the truth. I tell you the truth. Or he'll say, truly, truly, I say to you. See, he's not, a, he's appealing to the Father. So he's appealing. He's saying, my authority is from the Father. That's why whoever honors the Son honors the Father. Whoever honors the Father honors the Son. This is what they couldn't get. It would be like me, what we've had cult leaders do this. Saying, I have a new teaching. God's given it to me. And, and, and you know, it, it would be cultish if somebody came up here and started saying, this is what I believe. Especially, think about it, Jesus says what? 14.6. This is how he came across to them. 
I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. What kind of a statement is that? That will be like, I'll pick on Sylvia, but Sylvia standing up and saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Whoever comes to the Father must come through me. That's what they're hearing Jesus saying. And so they were, they, they, but they didn't have their eyes open. Jesus is God. He's not hiding anything from anybody. In verse 16 through 18, it says, Jesus answered them and said, My doctrine is not mine, but his who sent me. If anyone wills to do his will, he shall know concerning the doctrine, whether it is from God or whether I speak on my own authority. He who speaks from himself seeks his own glory, but he who seeks the glory of the one who sent him is true, and no unrighteousness is in him. So in the reading. So Jesus, they're saying, who gives you this authority to teach? We didn't send you, and Jesus is going to answer them. He said, I don't need your authority from the Jews. My authority comes from God the Father, because I'm God. That's why when he did these miracles, when he walked on water, uh, when he says, I am the bread of life, he just got done saying that, or I am that I am, he's claiming to be God. They knew what he was claiming. See, maybe the Jews challenged Jesus' ability to teach, but Jesus is challenging their ability to hear and to understand the truth. And that's what he's, I'll say, uh, maybe attacking. Because what I uh, uh, titled this message was, What is the Purpose of the Law? And this is what Jesus is going to get into here. They're using, they're, uh, uh, using the law for wrong. They, they're, they're interpreting scripture the wrong way. Now, discipleship, if you talk about discipleship, it's not just embracing certain ideas. It also involves acting on them. You see, uh, the, the more obedient that we are, the more peace we're going to experience. If one is obedient to his or her moral purpose, which is in harmony with God's will, then that person will come to know the true origin of Jesus' teaching. That's what he's saying to them. Now, this is important. I'm going to flesh this out in a minute. But the yielding of self-will to the will of God is the key that unlocks spiritual discernment. If you fall on your faith, if we take, I'll say it, say this every week, but I'll never quit saying this. When you're born again, your new nature produces obedience. Regeneration produces obedience. Obedience does not produce regeneration. Okay, that's important to remember. And so Jesus is not speaking in his own name. He's not seeking to make himself great, but seeks the glory of the one who sent him, the Father. Because Jesus seeks the Father's glory, shows that there's no selfishness in the teaching of Jesus. There's no corruption. There's nothing that would make what he'd say untrue. You know, that, I got to stop there for a minute because I really was convicted over this. You know, are we really seeking God's glory in everything? Or do we want to take some of the credit? We all fall into it. Maybe I'm the only one. I doubt it. We all want to fall into it. It's easy. Pride is the snare of the devil. Pride is. It's easy to think, I'm the one that's going to grow the church. I'm the one that can interpret the Bible. I'm the one that can do this or that. You know, that's it. It's, if we, if Jesus is perfect. Okay? But how he's teaching them, that's why they had no answer back to him. They finally just crucified him. Because they know by his expression, the way he acts, the way he talks, everything's for the glory of God. And I wish I could get there. Maybe in heaven I will. Everything I do, I praise God. So Jesus speaks and teaches the truth regardless of what it's going to cost him. And this is, this is important. There, he was no crowd pleaser. Okay? He loves people too much to tickle their ears. He's going to tell them the truth. And now remember, the majority of the crowd's hostile towards him. Some pastors and teachers will only teach what is safe as they try and discern maybe which way the wind is blowing politically. 
if I teach this, even though the Bible says it, it's going to be politically wrong, so I better not teach that. Or if I go over this hard doctrine, maybe it's going to upset some people and they might leave the church. You don't have a choice when you go verse by verse, as Alba Morrow said, Alba Morrow. You go verse by verse, you're going to you're going to run into hard doctrines, and you're either chicken out and go back to topical teaching, or you're just going to take the word of God for what it says. But every believer who desires to know God's will must seek it with the intention of obeying it once it's been revealed to them. Now, this is what I wanted to get back to. You know, going back to verse 17, if anyone wills to do his will, he shall know concerning the doctrine, whether it's from God or whether I speak on my own authority. Okay, that phrase, you know, like, to do his will, is only used one other time, and it's in John 9.31, which we'll get to soon. The blind man, you know, when the, when the blind man says in verse 31 in chapter 9, he says, now we know that God does not hear sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, he hears it. Okay, now, this is the thing. There's a connection between God and the person who seeks uh, uh, and lives for God. Okay, A kind of life that flows from the fear and reverence of God. Scripture continually reminds us what that the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. But when I say that, the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom doesn't mean it's an, I'll say, an ethical demand that leads toward faith. If I start fearing God, then I'll be saved. No, it's the outworking of your belief. In other words, it is a fruit of regeneration. You see, we obey. I want to obey God, not to hope that I become saved, because I'm already saved. See what the different motive would be? If I'm, if I'm, I'll say it, if I'm trying to obey God and go through certain things, certain stages, whatever you want to call it, so I don't lose my salvation, your motive is probably wrong. And you should be obeying God because you're already saved out of thankfulness to God. Now the question comes, well, so what are you saying? You Baptist, one saved, always saved, and you live any way you want. No, because if you do, if you think that, then you're probably not saved. We're going to fall. We're going to sin. But it doesn't define who we are. Now, uh, I'll say this really fast. There are three signs that describe a, a pastor or a teacher that seeks after his own glory. Okay, number one, maybe they insist on using their title and credentials. That's iffy there. But you've met people, you know, that oh, I'm a doctor. Or uh, how about this? I've had this happen to me. Call me Reverend. Call me Pastor. Well, okay, that you can't really say that, but that's just one thing. If you have all three of these, then you probably are. Number two, they're preoccupied with their position in the program. They're too occupied about where I fit into the, the worship service. Or three, they take this one, the big one. They take the credit of success rather than giving it to God. See, that's the key. It's like Judy. I was over visiting Judy the other day. You know, she just said, I praise the Lord for how he's taken a hold of, uh, taking care of me. She meant it. She meant it. You know what I told her? That's, you know, we have to come to a factual conclusion here. I believe this with all my heart. Christianity is a remnant in America. So by you saying you give glory to God, you thank God for everything, how he provides for you. You know how precious that is in God's sight? Because most people, or non-believers, are going to take credit. But when you, it's like when Debbie said that one time, I couldn't find, I think it was a key or something, and, and so she prayed to God, and she, she found the key. But what she do? She said, I praise the Lord for helping me find the key. That may sound... Simple to you, but that's precious faith in action. And verse 19 and 20 says, Did not Moses, okay, this is where it gets good. Did not Moses give you the law, yet none of you keeps the law? Why do you seek to kill me? The people answered and said, You have a demon. Who is seeking to kill you? So ends the reading. So what's going to happen here over the next six verses is Jesus 
He's comparing their reception of the law of Moses with their intent to kill him, which ex actually exposes their violation of it. In other words, falling short of keeping the law should have turned them to God. And that's the law's purpose right there. It's like they want to kill Jesus. Their motive inside is to kill Jesus. And now Jesus, I guarantee you by this time, has already given the Sermon on the Mount probably several times. And what is he saying in the Sermon on the Mount? You've heard it said, thou shalt not kill. But if you have a grudge or hatred towards your brother, you've broken that commandment. You see, people, a lot of people don't understand how to take the law. You say Ten Commandments. Okay? You use the Ten Commandments, for example. We should follow those Ten Commandments, but don't ever think following those Ten Commandments is what gets you into heaven. Because Jesus took that completely apart in the Sermon on the Mount. Thou shalt not commit adultery. You've heard it said. Do you lust after a woman? It's not me saying it, Jesus. So he's saying you've broken it. Thou shalt not covet. Do you at any time ever wish you had what your neighbor had? You just broke it. Thou shalt worship, worship no other gods before me. Do you worship yourself before Jesus? I guarantee you, you do. You may not have it in your mind that you do. Subconsciously, you do. We break the commandments all the time. But that should drive you to Jesus, which it does. And then when you accept Christ, because he's the only one that fulfilled it, he's the only one that lived the perfect sinless life, now you want to keep the commandments. You, you struggle to keep them because you want to please them, not to gain merit, not to gain salvation, because you already have it. But to, because to be obedient, you have peace. Now anybody, you know, I, I'll say this. I gotta get going on this. It's like taste and see that the Lord is good. Okay, I can't get into somebody else's soul, obviously. So I don't know what's going on inside of them. Only God does. But I don't care. I go by what Scripture says here. If you want to know as well, to do as well, then 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 be obedient. Okay. And what's the first step of obedience? The first and final step of obedience. When I get technical, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ that He fulfilled the law, that He's your perfect righteousness. Believe in that. Now, if you're out and you say you believe that, but you're also doing these other things in order to make sure you get to heaven, be it baptism. Three or four other things. And you're saying that has to be part of faith. It's faith plus obedience. You're not saved. And you will not have that peace of mind. You may think you have a peace of mind, but you don't. Ask a Christian that has placed their complete faith in what Jesus Christ has done, and that alone, and I guarantee you, their fruit of regeneration, they're obeying God, you know, through their, they're going to fall, and they know when they fall, but their, their pattern of life is obeying God, they're going to have to share that peace, and I guarantee you that other person does not have. They may think they do, but they don't. Now, by enforcing their own laws, remember this, this is where they, they pervert the law, the Jewish people, the Jewish leaders, by enforcing their laws regarding the Sabbath, they're about to break one of the Ten Commandments. Okay? Since they hated Jesus, they were blind to their own sin. They don't see that they're breaking, thou shalt not kill. And you go back to 518, in uh, and, and blasphemy, 518, where it says, Therefore the Jews sought all the more to kill him, because he not only broke the Sabbath, but also said that God was his Father, making himself equal with God. So the Jews who pride themselves on keeping the law, because Jesus said, who are you? You sit there and you say you keep the law, but you don't even realize you're breaking it right now, trying, wanting to kill me. This person keeps the law. He says, I keep the Ten Commandments, and yet they have fantasies about Seth. But in their mind, they think they're keeping the law. See, the Lord has to convict you of sin. He has to show you the proper way to, to, to understand what is being said. Any type of disobedience or lack of faith, probably the same thing, adding some type of merit with faith alone 
you're not going to have peace with your belief. You're not. I guarantee you, you're not. Now, it did say, you have a demon. Who's trying to kill you? What they're saying there is, I think, more than likely, you're insane. Who's trying to kill you? Not legally demon-possessed, but you're insane. Nobody's trying to kill you. But what they didn't know, the crowd saying that, was they couldn't read other people's motives. And Jesus could. So he knew that there's a lot of you in this crowd that are seeking to kill me. But, and I'm convinced of this, if you go back to Mark chapter 3, the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, they, they did say he was demon-possessed. They did say he's doing these miracles through Satan. They couldn't deny he's doing miracles. They're just saying he has to be doing it through Satan. So yes, there are many there that thought he was demon-possessed. But before I finish up with 21 through 24, there is a popular belief among the Jews that Abraham kept the entire law even before it had come. It's in uh, T-Quidets 521, whatever. It's in their writings. They actually believe that they could keep the law. And they even said, before Abraham even received the law, because Moses is the one that gave the law, right? He already kept the law before he even knew what the law was. Now, go to 21 through 24. It says, Jesus answered and said to them, I did one work, and you all marvel. Moses, therefore, gave you circumcision, not that it was from Moses, but from the fathers. And you circumcise a man on the Sabbath. If a man receives circumcision on the Sabbath so that the law of Moses should not be broken, and are you angry with me because I made a man completely well on the Sabbath? Do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. So ends the reading. So he's referring, by referring back to Abraham or the patriarchs, he's, he's, he's showing that if he had a, that he has authority prior to Moses, because they always said he's going to be the new Moses. Or who do you think you are? They they held Moses up on a pedestal. So what Jesus is correcting them, saying uh, uh, about circumcision, this was given before Moses was even on the scene, and that's what he's appealing to. And remember, you go back to John five, and a lot of these miracles that Jesus did. This is how you process it. By healing the whole person, and back in John 5 by the pool, he's demonstrating his creative power was equal to God's and superior to Moses. Because they said Moses gave us circumcision. Okay, The Jewish leaders were so engrossed with, with their Sabbath keeping that they missed the Messiah, which the scriptures pointed to. See, circumcision for then had, had proceeded over the Sabbath. But Jesus is saying, my healing on the Sabbath is what fulfills the law. See, they didn't see the lesser to greater contrast. The physical act of circumcision is one part of the body. But when Jesus comes and he heals people, he's not healing them for TBN to put on TV. Okay? That's not what he's doing miracles for. He's doing miracles to prove that he's the Messiah. He goes back to Isaiah and everything else. But but he's doing a miracle. The physical act of healing the whole person is a sign of the redemptive purpose of God. He's saying, my healing on the Sabbath, this whole person, is contrast to the, what you consider healing the person by a little portion of their body. See, the law reveals sin and falling short of gaining salvation. When you read the Bible, that's how you should should be reading it. It should be convicting you of sin. It should be convicting you of sin and, and understanding that that uh, I'm hopeless. But Christ is the one that, that healed everything. I think that was my cue to